We're going to hear now from Priscilla Salant on Idaho's early learning landscape. Priscilla Salant directs the University of Idaho's McClure Center for Public Policy Research. The McClure Center conducts and promotes research on public policy issues that impact Idaho, the region, and the nation. For the last 25 years, Ms. Salant has focused on leadership and community development. In 2014, she was honored with a nomination for the Idaho Businesswoman of the Year. Please welcome Priscilla Salant. Okay, 18 minutes. Oops, no, 12 minutes. I, I, that's your attention span, okay. Um, I'll move quickly. So each of you has a copy of a McClure Center report that we prepared specifically for this conference. And today is the first day that we have um, released the report. I worked on it with my wonderful U of I colleagues, Aaron Cruz and Christy Darian up in Moscow. And we also had wonderful help from Beth Oppenheimer at the Idaho Association for the Education of Young Children and Lauren Nekochea um, with Idaho Voices for Children. My remarks this morning are drawn from the report, um, which we actually put together uh, in, in response to questions posed to us by legislators. The legislators with whom we spoke leading up to the conference said they needed a better understanding of, um, of where children are today, exactly the question that Dr. Womack um, posed. They told us they wanted an assessment of what opportunities to learn Idaho's young children have. And they also wanted to understand and have better data on how well Idaho's young children are prepared once they get to kindergarten. So this was a pretty tall order and I hope that we've at least begun to do justice to the questions that uh, the legislators posed to us in what we call Idaho's early learning landscape. So as I mentioned, one of the questions we were asked as we developed the report was how well prepared kindergartners are when they, when they start school. The fall kindergarten Idaho reading indicator is really the first point in our children's lives when we have a chance to assess how those first 1,000 days went. As Idaho's child development specialist said to me most emphatically, the IRI comes with a lot of caveats. It measures only one dimension of the skills that children learn during those first thousand years that Dr. Womack talked about. Those cognitive, social, emotional, and linguistic skills, which are inextricably tied together and that research tells us are critical to success. So the IRI is just a partial measure and it's an imperfect one at that, but it is the starting point and it's really the only metric we have now on the, on the great majority of our children. So the IRI test in the fall of the kindergarten year measures how well children can name and sound out letters. I, I probably oversimplified that and I apologize to the educators in the room. The most recent test scores show that 54% of kindergartners in the fall of their first year have skills at or above grade level. That means 54% are ready to learn to read. And as this map shows, it's also in the report that you have, the fall kindergarten scores really vary so widely across the state of Idaho. In the map there, the counties in green are those in which the share of kindergartners ready to learn to read is over 50%. The counties in yellow and orange are those in which less than 50% are ready. And when we look at school district level data, the results, the variation is much greater. There is a district in which only 15% of kindergartners in the fall are ready to learn to read. And there's another district in which 92% of the kindergartners are ready 
to learn to read. So it's clear that the landscape across Idaho is very uneven by the time kindergarten begins. So what do we know about this uneven landscape? What's going on across Idaho? Which children are most at risk for falling behind as they move through school? In his new book, which I encourage you to read, Our Kids, the American Dream in Crisis, Robert Putnam, who's a political scientist from Harvard, talks about the impact of what he calls precarious work and fragile families. The impact of precarious work and fragile families on children's first 100 days. Putnam gives this powerful summary of early learning literature. Healthy brain development in children turns out to be closely correlated with parental education, income, and social class. In other words, some kids are at a lot more risk than others. And what do we know about the risk levels among Idaho's young children? There are about 140,000 of them under the age of six. 55% live in homes where all parents work. Robert Putnam asserts that not all of these children are at risk. Instead, it's the kids from fragile families whose, for whose parents' work is very precarious. One in five Idaho kids live in poverty. One in four live in single parent households. And these, according to the research, are what Dr. Womack said, miss out on those critical serve and return interactions. And what other researchers call dependable interactions with adults and safe environments to explore. Those are the same themes that came up in Dr. Womack's presentation. So again, the landscape in Idaho is tremendously uneven. So in preparing for this conference, what I found is that the conversations about early learning quickly gravitate to, should we have preschool or should we not have preschool? That seems to be kind of the fault line in the political dialogue. But if there's one key policy takeaway from Dr. Womack's presentation is that it is that learning starts way before preschool. If we wanna talk about early learning policy, we have to think more broadly about this period of birth to five years old. So let's consider what kind of approaches and programs promoting early learning hood in Idaho. We came up with three kind of overlapping approaches and programs in Idaho. Home-based or family-based programs is the first, early intervention is the second, and child care and preschool is the third. So let's start with home and family-based programs. Their examples are parents as teachers, the nurse-family partnership, the Idaho Commission on Libraries, many wonderful programs in which, in which libraries and schools partner. Um, one of them is the Read to Me program, for example. And then there are many nonprofit home visiting programs. These are all about families and home environment. And then there are early intervention programs. These include the federally funded infant toddler program, state development, developmental preschools, Head Start, and Early Head Start. And Dr. Womack talked about what's a quality program. All of these early intervention in, have a high degree of parental involvement. Last, child care and preschool programs, some with state and city licensing, others with various kinds of accreditation, and still others that are neither licensed nor accredited. So here was, I'm gonna show you kind of in a summary, the slide will be a little hard to see, our first attempt to answer that question about where Idaho's young children are. I'm gonna start with programs that have professional standards for caregivers or educators. It's really hard to say what really defines a high quality, but one thing that the childhood development specialists seem to agree on is that professional standards are very important. It is one measure of programs 
that provide high quality learning and opportunities. Some of the data I'll present to you are in terms of um, enrollment, some in terms of capacity or slots, but generally um, the difference here is between programs that we know have professional standards and those that may or may not, we don't really know. So starting at um, the bottom, a number so small that the people over there can't possibly read it, there are about 500 children served by home visiting programs, um, basically the ones that are maternal, infant, and child childhood home visiting programs. Th this is really a trio of three federal funding programs, federally funded programs, with the capacity to serve 500 kids in Idaho. Second, our NIAC accredited um, programs, again, it's green, those are the ones with professional standards. There are 19 NIAC accredited programs in Idaho with the capacity to serve about 1,800 kids. NIAC is the parent organization of Beth Oppenheimer's um, program, the National Association for the Education of Young Children. Next is state developmental preschools, some of which are brick and mortar schools, but others which are, um, which are not. These include the in-district preschools, cooperative preschools that are serving more than one district, um, community early learning programs, centers, and in some cases, um, early Head Start or Head Start uh, educators based in um, learning centers. So this is, um, some people say preschool is an age, not a, not a place, and that really is the case with this. About 2,800 kids in Idaho are served by state developmental preschools. Next, infant and toddler program. This is an early intervention program that's intended to identify and serve young children at risk. It includes therapy, counseling and home visiting, and health centers, uh, health, sorry, health services. That's another 3,700 kids or so. Next is Head Start and Early Head Start with, a, with um, 5,000, uh, enrollment of about 5,000 kids. Head Start and Early Head Start are federally funded programs, again, that pr promote school readiness among young children, low income young children specifically. So both Head Start and Early Head Start have, they, they are evaluated very thoroughly and they have a very strong parental involvement component. As I mentioned, they serve about 5,000 kids. There are only enough Head Start um, slots in Idaho to serve one in five income eligible children. Next is public kindergarten. So we know public kindergarten has professional standards for education. It's part of our, our school system. As you know, kindergarten is not mandated in Idaho, but the great majority of age eligible children attend, roughly 21,000. Um, after that, then we have some licensed childcare programs. There are eight cities in Idaho that require some kind of licensing requirements. We called, um, there's no centralized source of information on city license programs, so we called all eight cities and we asked for them to tell us how, what their um, capacity was. And we came up with about 8,100 slots in city licensed childcare. We don't know whether they have professional standards for their caregivers and educators or not. They may and they may not. Next is state licensed care. Idaho requires that all child care providers serving more than six kids be licensed. And the licensing basically aims to ensure that kids are safe, but there are no requirements for parental involvement and there are very few professional standards. Uh, uh, there are f very few requirements surrounding professional standards. So we don't know exactly what kind of learning opportunities are in available in state licensed childcare. And then there's the really big bar. We absolutely don't know where the rest of the kids are. Um, I was encouraged to put a number on that. How many is it? But, but we really don't know. 
So there's the question mark. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. There, there are not a lot of numbers out there, but let me give you the highlights of what our research showed. And it aligns with what Dr. Womack said. Birth to five is a critical period for learning, first. Second, Idaho has no comprehensive system to track where children are, where they're cared for, and how much they're learning before they get to kindergarten. Next, family engagement, parental involvement is a critical element of early learning programs, like Head Start, like the libraries programs, like parents as teachers, family involvement is critical. Last, though we lack good information on early learning opportunities across Idaho, we do know that only 54% of kindergartners are ready to learn to read. This suggests that Idaho has a lot of room for improvement. Thank you so much. And we do have now uh, some time to ask Priscilla some questions. We have a couple of questions to start off with. Uh, Priscilla, you, we heard a lot about data. And it seems like we do a lot of collection of data throughout grade school, kindergarten through 12th grade. We seem to know how our students are doing, how they're testing. Uh, but it seems like there's a lack of data pre-preschool. We're not talking about preschool. But we're talking about kids who are birthed to five years old. Does Idaho need a statewide data system for our young children? My gut instinct is to say, my gut instinct is to say no. Um, right now, we have a lot of data systems under development. We are learning what works and what doesn't. Parents have a lot of concerns. Schools have a lot of concerns. So I personally would not jump to a comprehensive data system um, pre-kindergarten. I would say there's a lot we don't know. I'd love to hear from members of the audience what you think we still need to know. But I would say that there are simpler ways, even telephone household surveys or other um, information gathering strategies to find out more about our young children in Idaho. Can you say anything about early childhood workforce needs? Good, that's a good question. We, um, we actually tried to get some data for our report on the number of certificates and degrees for, for caregivers and educators and we ran into a few barriers. Um, but I'm happy to say that Julie Fodor at the University of Idaho is doing a comprehensive study of the workforce needs in early um, childhood development in Idaho and that uh, report will be out in October of this year. Another question from the audience. Uh, what are the complexities or factors behind the unknown population? Mm. So one to start with would be that children in child care centers and preschools that serve less than, that six children are less, are not required to be licensed. So we really don't have any idea. Those are kids in, in a parent or relative's home children who are not anywhere other than their own home during the day. Um, and uh, and th so the, the, the programs that aren't licensed, we, we can't say anything about um, what's going on in those. And um, so that's one, one issue. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about early childhood learning, uh, I think the question comes down to what do we do and who should be responsible for this? Uh, based on the data that you've seen, uh, does that lead us to any conclusions? So I, um, I mentioned the fault line around, yes, we should have preschool. No, we shouldn't have preschool. But there's another fault line around, is it the family's responsibility or is it the public sector's responsibility in, in the schools, for example? Um, my, my thought from looking at the variety of community-based state-based fed and, and federally funded programs, such a wide variety, um, and the critical role that parents play. I think it's a false dichotomy between 
whether it's the parents' responsibility or it's the public sector's responsibility, it will take all of us at home, in school, in care centers across the state. Another question from the audience, how would you describe an excellent preschool? As an agricultural economist, I'm going to defer, <laughs> I'm really going to um, ask others from, from the audience to, to help with that question. Beth, would you want to talk about that? Really, sweetie. <laughs> best person to answer, answer this either, but, um, you know, a preschool, I think it's really, really important that when we're talking about um, preschool and early learning environments, and someone said it back here, is it has to be quality. And, and quality means that um, there are, we're following early learning guidelines, we're following the standards, and it also has to include parent involvement. Because if it does not include parent involvement, and parent engagement, it cannot be a quality preschool program. Mm. Ratios. Lots of different standards with that, but I just wanted to touch on the top of it. So quality providers, ratios, whole bunch of standards serve down the list. So yes, serve and return. That wasn't a great answer. <laughs> An interesting question right after what you just said. Another question, how many early childhood professionals receive benefits? For instance, health insurance, vacation, retirement, pensions, et cetera. So that is exactly one of the questions that Julie Fodor at the University of Idaho is addressing in her report. She's looking at the different degree requirements, income earned, experience. Um, and so that question about benefits is, is absolutely critical and um, we should know more about that in the fall. You know, a question that I had in my mind uh, in hearing Dr. Womack speak and some of the opening comments is this. Uh, I think a lot of people here in the state of Idaho who don't have children uh, feel like this may not be an important issue for them. But in listening to Dr. Womack, uh, a child who is well-educated uh, prior to entering kindergarten is much less prone to uh, uh, criminal behavior down the road. It uh, can directly be tied to our economy here in the state. So make the case that this is a community issue. Well, Erin, it, it feels like you just made that case because we are, <laughs> we are one society, we are one state. Um, the people who don't have uh, children in the school system anymore or never did certainly benefit from an educated um, citizenry. I'd like to hear your thoughts on how we're going to, how would you like to see us proceed from here on out in uh, uh, addressing early childhood learning? And I'm not just talking pre-K. So um, in, to answer that question, I would say that what the Andrus and McClure Center are doing today, which is talking across the aisle and putting aside different skills that we bring to the team. Uh, and that is, we do have a lot of, of testing to see how kids are doing in grade school K through 12 and even going on to higher education. And we do know that there are some complexities and some issues that we have to address there. Uh, what importance, how important is it to address all of these at the same time or should we address those problems in, in their later life or is this the solution that will help down the road? It, it's pretty hard to watch Dr. Womack's presentation and not think that the, the intervention, the assistance to parents has to come at a very, very early age. I, I don't think that you can draw any other conclusion from her presentation from the science of childhood development, that it starts very early in life. Another question I asked. <laughs> another question I asked last Friday, and that was, uh, you know, this whether we like it or not has a lot to do with money. Uh, but we do know that there are a lot of kids, based on this report that you've uh, laid out, I think the number was 83,000 uh, kids uh, before kindergarten who have parents, both parents in the home who are working. Uh, in some cases, we also have kids who are in poverty level 
homes who will struggle to try and get their kids into, say, preschool. For myself, we pay for it, but it, it, it's part of uh, what we feel is our responsibility as children. But there are some parents out there who that would be a very tough thing to swallow. So what are the first steps to overcoming that? To, to overcoming the... Fi the, the financial yeah. aspects. Um, so I... I think it's a reality in Idaho. There is not a lot of extra money that's going to that's going to instantly materialize for early childhood learning in Idaho. Um, we just went through a bruising battle in the state legislature around K through 12, and I, I don't feel like anyone has the stomach for a statewide um, big increase in in funding going to um, some kind of pre-K birth to five. Um, that, that is just the political reality in Idaho, and, and um, we, we are not going to be able to get away from that. So it's a long process. I think um, we're going to hear from two other states about how they put together the political will to start addressing the early learning um, the, the early learning challenges in their states, Utah and Mississippi. But in the end, it's going to take a long time. It's going to start most likely, I would think, with pilots and over time building up the political will to address the issue. And not just pre-K? Not just pre-K. Yeah, and that solution probably will have to bridge many other uh, locations. Uh, we, we Parents are, are a big part of this, but also... Uh, what role do, does religion, and I hate to bring religion into this issue, but you know, a lot of kids do get some, some uh, learning from, from their church. You didn't ask me that question on Friday, so, that, so that's a new one. Um, but um, so when you look at the, the experiments around Idaho, the different types of organizations, faith-based, community centers, school districts, visiting programs, there's a, a variety of programs, and the churches are certainly um, one of the important ones. That's They're part of our communities. They're part of the society that's going to help address the problem. Are, do we have anybody in the religious-based community that's here today? Got one over here. Got a couple, I guess, over there. So It's good to have everybody kind of here at the table to discuss this. What, what do you hope to, that comes out of this? What, what's... what's do you hope comes out of the end of this early learning conference today? So I, I can speak from the perspective of the McClure Center. We're not an advocacy or organization. Um, we don't take positions on various policy issues. But what we do try to do is facilitate the conversation where people find what do they value, what are the priorities that they believe should guide public policy development. So for me, that's that would be a wonderful outcome is if we could find common ground on what values and priorities should guide our policy development around early learning in Idaho. All right. I think that's about all the time we have for these questions. Priscilla Salant.